I'm not gonna say I'm your sand sexy man. Welcome to Wow of True, the podcast of your wildest memes. We're your one-stop internet culture shop here to dissect what's going viral, why we care, and how this might affect our real human lives. I'm your guy who forgot to fill this in, Isabel. And I'm Amanda. Anyone can be famous on the internet, so why not us? <laughs> so as you might have heard, there's a lot going on last week. The most important thing that happened on the internet was that on Tumblr, there was a sexy man poll and Sans from Undertale won. No, see, the thing is, it wasn't on Tumblr. It was on Twitter, but it was about the Tumblr sexy man, which is honestly, that's not the right population to be polling for the Tumblr sexy man. You need to go where the people are. For those who are like me and before like June 2022 did not play Undertale, Sans is an animated skeleton and is not meant to be sexy. So it's funny. The amount of porn on AO3 would suggest otherwise, man. <laughs> oh no. Okay, but who who is Sans paired with in that? Don't worry about it. I'm worried Don't about worry it. Don't worry about it. If it's papyrus, we riot. Don't worry about it. God damn it. Um, yeah, so aside from the Sans sexy man situation, the queen died and the internet had some things to say about it. The, the internet truly was crab raving. Uh, yeah, and then Trisha Paytas, who is a controversial influencer, was extremely pregnant throughout both the queen's death and 9-11. There were rumors that she gave birth at the same time as the queen died, and then everyone was like, reincarnation, but then she had to make a video saying that she didn't give birth. And also, if she had given birth on 9-11, I literally would have just had to quit the internet. Like, I <laughs> like I was like, like on 9-11, I was like, if Trisha Paytas has her baby, I'm going to lose my mind. But she had it on like the 14th, and do you know what she named her baby? I don't know what she named her baby. Malibu Barbie. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> But the thing is, my favorite take that I saw about this whole situation is that it's not actually that bad of a name when you consider that she's going to grow up in, like, L.A. with all the other influencer children whose names are also going to be, like, Princess Peach. The interesting thing here is that I think if a Malibu Barbie as a brand doesn't exist, Malibu Barbie as a name is fine. That being said, I really hope the reincarnation thing is real, because I think that would be really um, karmic for the Queen of England. Yeah, you know, if you do a colonialism, then you get reborn as the child of an influencer and have photos posted of you on the internet for millions of people to see from the moment you are a child, which is a little ethically weird, but we're not talking about that today. I mean, isn't that basically what happens to, like, royal babies anyway? It's just like, you know, it's royalty oh, too. this time we have- royalty too. L.A. <laughs> Wait, have you seen the post that's like, like, Jungkook seeing Trisha Paytas' baby and immediately drop kicking it? Wait, okay, I, explain to me the Jungkook thing. I've seen this meme going around, but I don't understand <laughs> how it relates to the queen. So the thing is, the other meme here is that Jungkook is a reincarnation of Princess Diana. And there's why? a whole long lengthy, like, explanation of why Jungkook is the reincarnation of Princess Diana. He's in BTS, right? Yes. Jungkook is one of the BTS guys. <laughs> um, and then the minute that he sees Trisha's Pages as baby, you know, his past life will kick in and he will immediately drop kick it. That's the bit. Because he is Princess Diana. That's amazing. It's, it's a complicated meme. The internet is sometimes a good place. Wow. Speaking of the internet being a good place... Isn't it cool that we have a podcast and that people listen to it and sent us questions to answer in our second ever Q&A episode, Extravaganza? Yeah, because we have hit 51 episodes and we decided it was time to answer your questions again. And, you know, they're all really important questions, like really hard hitting shit. Yes, extremely hard hitting. But honestly, this one, we, we put these questions in order and I was like, this has to be first. Gabriel wants to know, fuck, Mary kill, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos. And I have an extremely clear answer. I have thought this through and I am a thousand percent confident in my answer. Fascinating. Um, okay. Hmm. See, because I had the other approach where I kind of looked at that question, I blacked out, I didn't think about it again for days at a time. So I'm really going to be going through my thought process on air. Okay, well, do you want to start and then I'll go into my like very in-depth, like yeah. regimented um, academic response? Yeah, I think that's what we should do because I will have the bad answer and you will have the good answer and we should end with the good answer. Okay, cool. So I think the answer here is... 
the problem is it's like it's so many bad options in one place that it's like not good but okay so here's my my thinking i think that you cannot marry bezos because bezos has already gotten half his money taken away by his previous wife (laughs) he's 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 aware of that potentially happening and i think potentially the only reason to marry one of these guys is to divorce them and take their money oh so i don't think you can marry bezos in this case because he's aware of what could happen i think this is also true for elon right because elon is also has simply had situations Interesting. So I think he's too aware of what could happen in a marital spat. On the other hand, it would suck so bad to be maybe Zuckerberg. But on the other hand, you get all of Facebook. What's interesting is Zuck is the only one who has not been divorced. Right. So that maybe speaks to something about like the way that he conducts his personal life. And also, he isn't ready for the divorce court. So I think I'm going to go with Mary Zuck. (laughs) So I'm going to go with Mary Zuck. And then that leaves fucking kill. Okay. Elon and Bezos. They're both un- unfuckable. I think fuck Bezos, kill Elon. And the only reason I'm saying this is because Elon keeps having secret babies. And <laughs> I don't want to ha- the potential of being one of Elon's secret baby mamas. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a, real, a real concern. Okay, I think you made some really good points there. I will admit, I did not think about the Jeff Bezos losing half of his money part because I'm going to walk you through my thought process. So when you okay. think of fuck, Mary kill, is it fuck, Mary kill, or is it kill, fuck somebody once, or live with somebody and presumably fuck them several times? Mm. So I think that of these three men, Elon Musk is the biggest danger to society. Mm. So we're killing Elon. Sure. Then that leaves, do you want to marry Bezos or Zuck? So Zuck pisses me off too much. Not that Jeff Bezos doesn't, but also I think the fundamental difference here is that Zuck is actively the CEO of a company and Bezos is not. So Mm -hmm. I think it would be more fun to be married to, like both of them suck. It would be more fun to be married to a rich retired person who sucks than a rich mm-hmm. not retired person who sucks because then I feel like Bezos just like I don't know I feel like we would just like go on vacation and like have bad sex and I mean you could trade that's him. better than having bad sex and not oh no that's not where you I'm could going. trade him I think <laughs> I think it would just be bad no matter what because he's Jeff Bezos like I don't think there's a good option here you know I feel like you're trying to like pick the best of bad options so no, but I but I think that it would be very stressful to be like married to somebody who is running a big company and then made a decision to turn it into a metaverse company that has backfired spectacularly and is losing billions of dollars a quarter yeah that's true that does sound stressful on the other hand he would be too busy to like bother you I think it just sounds like a lot of emotional labor to be married to Mark Zuckerberg. (laughs) And I feel like Jeff Bezos is just like being rich and being like a rich person. And I don't know. I'm just in it for the vacations. I, you know, I can respect that. If Jeff Bezos doesn't go on vacation, I'm fine. (laughs) No, I feel like he's like building yachts. Like I think, I think he would have a good time and he would also like destroy the environment. But you know, it's a, it's a price you have to pay for being married to Bezos. Well, I could destroy the, the environment or I can destroy global politics and you know, both are bad. So that's my answer. I've thought about it very deeply. Honestly, I think this is very like logical. Yeah. I I think you validated yourself. I, again, this is not, there's no good answer here. (laughs) But I do like your answer of how Zuck is not prepared for divorce court and also you're a lawyer, so you're going to kill him. (laughs) But also he can probably afford like the best lawyers in the world. But according to me, my friend Isabel is the best lawyer in the world. I better be your favorite lawyer, not because I'm good at the law, but because I'm your friend. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'm, I guess I went in with the assumption that the marriage would lead to a divorce. And I guess I went in with the assumption that this would be a scam where I'm trying to take their money, which, you know, that maybe says something about my character. (laughs) That's the difference between us is I'm like, hmm, I'm like, well, if I'm getting married, then I'm obviously spending my life with this person. And meanwhile, I'm like, how do I scam this rich man out of his millions of dollars? Oh, oh, also, Bezos is older than Zuck, Mm. so he's gonna die sooner, presumably. Unless, no, just kidding. Only Isabel threatens to murder people on this podcast, even though we all, we both just decided to murder Elon. Yeah, I like that we both decided to murder Elon. I think that's good. And moving on, um, on a different note, Magdalena asks, how has your relationship with social media fame changed since you started the podcast? I think the biggest difference has been that I went into the podcast thinking, oh yeah, being famous on social media would be fun. And it's actually something that would be kind of like an entertaining thing to be. 
and the benefits of it outweigh all the other shit. And now that we're here 51 episodes in, I'm like, I absolutely do not want to be social media famous. Like, that sounds like it sucks. I thought you were going to say, now that we're famous, and I was like, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> but I do... I mean, honestly, I think I think my Twitter follower count has gone up by like 4,000 since we started the podcast, but that's because of working at TechCrunch.com, I think. I would say, I think it isn't the podcast necessarily that has changed it, but I think, I agree, I think before I was like, it would just be a good bit, like it would just be really funny if we were famous on social media. But in the time since we've started the podcast, there have been instances in which the alt-right gets mad at me. And, um, it's just kind of, it's just not a fun time. Like, it's fine. I could handle it. Like, don't come at me outright. I will, uh, destroy you. But it's a lot easier to go through life when people aren't actively trying to make your life difficult. Yeah. And I think for me, the realization was that, like, oh, social media fame has a lot more drawbacks and benefits for, like, most people. So, I don't know. Be careful what you wish for, I guess. Yeah, I think it's kind of fun being in a space where it's, like, there are people who have a parasocial relationship with me and follow me on social media and know who I am and I don't know who they are. But I think that when that amount of people grows to be too large, then you get yeah, into trouble. Yeah, like, honestly, like, I like being, like, niche popular on Tumblr. And I think that's actually the ideal amount of fame for anyone to have. Because now there's, like, people who know who I am, but it affects my daily life, like, 0%. I'm blowerbo from their dashboard. It's, like, great. Go follow me on Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> Except that you don't say your Tumblr on the show, even though, like, it's an open secret. It's fine. You have to be deep in the lore to know. You have to join the Discord to know. And you join the Discord by giving us $5 <laughs> a month on patreon.com slash wow Although true. that's not even true anymore, because I changed my Discord username, because I joined a bunch of, like, other Discords that I needed my, like, human per- professional ha- handle for. So now it's, like, that deep cut that you need to like look on the internet for. It's it's not hard. It's really easy. Yeah, I'll, if you give us money, I'll just tell you. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> um, and speaking of which, um, this is a question that you wanted us to discuss. But speaking of, how's the yeah, podcast how going? how is the podcast going? This was my question for you because Q&A means that I get to ask Amanda questions also. Um, um, I'm having fun. I think that now that thanks to our Patreon money, speaking of our Patreon, that we can pay people to edit, it makes it a lot less stressful because editing a podcast takes like eight hours and I already work too much. And so now we get to do the fun parts of the podcast, like talking to your friend and researching stupid internet stuff and talking to people on our discord which you can pay five dollars on patreon to join this you is know, just don't an sell it too hard <laughs> no <laughs> but that's the bit i'm doing a bit i'm i'm being travis mcelroy right now where i'm just leaning into a bit that nobody else thinks is that funny damn so, um, say, say more about which, how much you hate travis <laughs> I, I don't even know the McElroys that well. I listen to stuff occasionally. Like, I listened to the Besties episode about mm-hmm. Splatoon because I'm really into Splatoon now because... Because she's a gamer girl now, you know? <laughs> I'm a gamer girl. What better time to get into a video game franchise than the third installment? But also, um, Magdalena is currently my favorite WoW of True listener because she compared us to the McElroys, Vlogbrothers, and Multitude. Yeah, which is like, honestly... We're better than them. <laughs> no. I think we're better than the McElroys and Vlogbrothers, but... I don't think we're better than the McElroys. I think we're better than Multitude. <laughs> yeah, suck it, Eric. Fucking <laughs> suck it, Eric. <laughs> no, we love Multitude. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't listened to McElroys in, like, a couple years now, which is, like, weird because I was used to be very into it. Oh, this is, like, my dirty podcast secret, which is that I don't actually listen to that many podcasts on the regular because I have cannot listen to things disease. This is not a disease. It's just I'm bad at listening to things. I listen to enough podcasts for the both of us, so it's okay. I used to be like big on podcasts like three, four years ago, and I listened to like a million podcasts, and then I got a job. I don't know. I listen to a lot of stuff, even though I'm not commuting anywhere, but like, I think I have the opposite where I have the can't sit alone with my thoughts disease. Mm. So I'm basically always listening to a podcast or an audiobook if I'm just like idly alone in my house, which is like a serious amount of time. Oh, mood. Unless if I'm working, because that's too much going on in my brain. 
But if I'm, like, cooking dinner or whatever, I am listening to a thing. Yeah, see, because I usually end up putting on, like, TV for something like that. Because I also, like, have cannot listen to audiobooks disease. So I think it's just something about, like, Hmm. audio content that you have to pay attention to that my brain does not like listening to people. Okay, see, that's my problem is I'm really behind on TV. Like, I, like, don't really watch TV except in big spurts. Mm -hmm. Like, I will binge watch, like, an entire show and then I won't watch TV for months and I'll just be, like, listening to podcasts and, like yeah. audiobooks or whatever. Well, the weird thing is I don't actually like watch a lot of narrative TV if that makes sense. Shout out to Roshan and Aaron who've been trying to get me to watch Succession for like a million years and they're like, Isabel, watch Succession and I've just been, I'm so bad at watching like TV that's actually like a story. I, I watch like fucking like cooking shows what I watch. I think that we should watch Succession together and make it a Discord thing. <laughs> God, I'm not against the idea, but Succession is just so like intense. Succession is like very dramatic. Succession is like you have to be like in the pit to watch is how I felt about it. We're getting so off topic. Yeah. Well, how do you think the podcast is going? I think we're doing pretty good. I think we actually I think the biggest difference between us now and us a year ago is that we have a better workflow, which it has to do with like, you know, now we have Patreon money and now we can pay someone to edit, etc. But also we know vaguely what we're doing when we like put together an episode and what's interesting to talk about and what's not interesting to talk about. The one thing I think actually we should work on is marketing. Yeah. Well, we've been saying this for forever, but we both have full-time jobs that end up being more than 40 hours a week. Yeah, like we're both doing shit. So it's like that ends up going by the wayside. But I think this has been the problem since the beginning and more so I think as we get more professional is that people who listen to the show, like 90% of them like it and they will stay with it. We are just not good at getting the show in people's ears. And I I don't even want to say not good at it. It's just that we haven't like done any work for it. And you know, that's yeah, I think on it's us. Just that we haven't had the time. But the more money we get on Patreon, that means we can hire someone. <laughs> this is this is just a hour long ad. I mean, what is a podcast except an hour long ad. Oh, I was also gonna say something when we were talking about other podcasters. My hot take is that you have to be kind of annoying to be a podcaster. I think all podcasters oh, yeah. are like slightly annoying by default. Like, I think that's a personality trait you need. Zoe asked, what is the weirdest legal loophole slash nuance that you know? Which is a question for me and not for Amanda. But Amanda, I do want to hear what yours is. <laughs> I guess um, I think it's interesting that you can't be tried for the same crime twice. Yeah. So if you if you do a crime and then you get away with it, then you can just be like, haha, suckers, and then nothing can happen to you. Double jeopardy, baby. Yeah, that's what it's called. I learned that in like seventh grade civics. I love that for you. I feel like I don't know any loopholes, but I think the f- a couple of facts I would like to tell you is that first of all, in most like criminal law classes, you end up reading the cannibalism case, which is is a case where like these two guys are in a boat and they eat the third guy and the context for this is that you're starving on a boat and the other context for this is that it was totally acceptable to just eat people on the high seas in the sense that's like yeah man you're starving the guy's dying can you do this or not but then these guys get like tried for it this is like all in like ye olden days this is not a recent case let me put it that way well when is ye olden like days like 1800s i think It's either 1800s or 1700s. But the thing is that like everybody did this. They were just, you know, they were morbing all over the place. They were just eating people. Um, (laughs) So the guys who were getting on trial for this were like totally surprised by the fact that there was a guilty verdict. Because they're like, what do you mean we're getting punished for eating people? Everybody eats people. And the other fun fact about the ocean that I have is that high seas law is called the law of the sea. And that's all I got for you. I like that. None of this ever comes up in my daily life. I just like these facts. Yeah. See, when I hear that, I think to myself, Self, like I would probably just rather starve than kill somebody and eat them. But then again, I don't know what it's like to be starving on the high seas. Wait, you've not so been on the high hard. seas. You know, anything goes out there. You can just fucking eat people, I guess. Except now you can't. <laughs> Yeah, I like how what we learned from a hit show, Our Flag Means Death, is that all the pirates were gay because anything goes on the high seas. But then in reality, anything goes on the high seas means that it's okay to eat people. You know, I think if it was a sufficiently comedic situation or if it made plot relevant sense, I'm not going to spoil this even though it's like been months. Like, I think Our Flag Means Death would go there. (laughs) Maybe. You know, be gay and eat people. That's what they say. in (laughs) The last um, episode of Our Flag Means (laughs) (laughs) It's very much about that. All right, Amanda, 
Least favorite meme and why? I'm gonna go with Pepe because I feel like, in case you haven't seen the documentary Feels Good Man, a serious film about Pepe the Frog as a meme, Pepe the Frog originally was just kind of a sad frog. Nothing more to it, just a sad frog. And then it slowly got appropriated into like 4chan and into like darker like corners of the internet and then around the time that Trump was running for office, it became associated with the kinds of fascist adjacent things that Trump stands for. And then the Anti-Defamation League called it a hate symbol, but also the ADL is uh, taken with a grain of salt. But I guess like when I see Pepe, my first thought is like Trump, racism, white supremacy kind of shit. Mm -hmm. But I think Pepe actually has in a lot of internet people's brains turned the corner and become just a fun frog again. So like Pepe's really big on Twitch. Pepe's really big in crypto, which we're not gonna go there (laughs) wow if true not going into crypto what day is this yeah (laughs) i guess i just worry that it could be a dog whistle for those sorts of things even though i do genuinely believe that most people are just kind of going with it and being like yep that's a frog but it just still sits weird with me but i think that's a me problem i think what it is is that like i mean it was a very deliberate attempt to like pull Pepe back away from the alt-right because, like, the creator was very much like, bro, what the fuck is this about that, I think? Mm -hmm. And it's not random, it's deliberate, but, like, I completely see what you're saying. I guess it just sort of begs the question of can you reappropriate something that was appropriated for bad? I don't mean is that ethically okay, but just can you literally do I mean, I think they're doing that right now. Like, I think also it's just, like, what symbols mean, like, changes based on the group of people that are using them. I don't know. We'll see how this one plays out in the end, I think. I feel like my least favorite memes are less, like, ideological than yours. Mine's just like, (laughs) no, I'm dead serious. I'm like, my least favorite meme is when somebody makes a post, like, is like, do you love the color of the sky? Which is an old Tumblr meme. Do you remember this? I don't. Okay, well, what it is is that do you love this color of the sky is basically a post that is long as shit, where it cycles through all the colors of the sky, and then at the end, usually somebody will put something like, the Skyrim, like, oh, you're waking up sort of thing. My annoyance with it is just that it's so long and it clogs your entire dashboard. And, like, that's also my problem with, like, B-movie memes and stuff like that, where I'm like, yes, this is very funny. Oh, yeah. You are taking up so much real estate on my screen, no matter what the screen is. Yeah. I also wonder, so I feel like there's, like, a collection of phrases that were really popular on Tumblr, like, 10 years ago that then went out of fashion because they were, like, quote-unquote chewy, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, I do think this is a good use of chuggy. Like stuff like what is air or like H N N N N N N N N N G. Oh god, that's old. That's old, old. But I kind of feel like they might make a comeback in a sense of like how Y2K fashion is back. Yeah, cringe is cool again. I think we might see some old meme renaissance. Buy stocks in old Tumblr memes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm sure there's some bad startup out there where someone's trying to make it possible to invest in memes, and I hate that. I think we should start it. I think we would do a great job. Wow, wow if true becomes startup. Incredible. On that note, what's your favorite animal who is Insta slash social media famous? Okay, so you know how I hate doggo culture. We've We've talked talked about about this. We've talked about this extensively, yes. Um... I, de- I deliberately didn't mention Doggo as my least favorite meme and instead went for like, let's talk about culture. I do like dogs. And my favorite animal who is social media famous is Bunny the dog. Bunny is a national treasure. It's like at what about Bunny. Mm-hmm. And it's this dog who is extremely sophisticated with like communication using buttons. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. Like the Like when you train the dog to like be able to speak using the buttons. Yeah, so the dog will be like, dad, where? And then the owner is like, dad's at work. Mm. And then Bunny will be like, play, friend. And then it's like, oh, you want to go to the dog park? And like, I think there's a lot of discourse about how real this is, but I just want to believe that Bunny is a genius <laughs> and I'm obsessed with Bunny. Bunny's the best. Nice. Forbes did a list of like top 50 creators recently. Was Bunny on there? Yeah, Bunny was number like 40 something. And I was like, fuck yeah. Christ. You go, Bunny. You're better than Charlie D'Amelio, Bunny. (laughs) I have a lot of opinions about a dog making that list, but that's okay. My favorite animal. I feel like, I feel like Isabel lore is that like, Isabel doesn't really like animals in general, but yeah, (laughs) I think my favorite one, and this is a fictional animal and it's not real, but like Kevin, 
Have you seen Kevin? No. So Kevin is this like little black, like little creature that is always drawn on like really small, wearing like a big, like Elizabethan, like rough and like on just pieces of furniture. Kevin really embodies, I am just a little creature. I cannot change this. And Kevin's by this like one artist. And it's like, every time I see Kevin, I'm like, yeah, that's my boy. I got nothing for you. That's all I got. <laughs> if you had seen Kevin, you would understand everything about what I'm saying. So next thing is, what is your favorite post or tweet that you made that never took off? And this question is from Andromeda, and also I I got nothing. All my posts are perfect, and they all take off. I'm gonna actually answer the other side of this question, which is posts that I regret having taken off, because I made a really shitty D and D post once, and it's just just gotten reposted everywhere, including like Reddit, everywhere like that. And I'm just kind of like, yeah. damn, it's not that deep. What about you? So my immediate thought is lettuce bracket. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to like episode 10 or something. But I made a tweet on September 15th that got three likes and I thought it was very funny. <laughs> okay. Trisha Paytas deserves to name her baby in a time when XAEA12 exists. If Elon Musk named his kid Malibu Barbie, we'd all be like, wow, finally a normal name. I think that's a pretty good tweet. I think it deserves at least four or five likes. <laughs> Yeah, like, I, I feel like I should have gotten, like, 12 likes on that. I, yeah, you know, I think you should remake that post and see if it does better. But then people would know. You have to delete the original. That's all you have to do. Well, maybe I'll post it from WoW of True. I think you should post it from WoW of True. If you can make one thing that was guaranteed a meme, what would it be? I had a good answer. It's voting. I want voting to be a meme. People would do it then. Next, next question. Yeah. When we were going through these questions, we were like, do we have an answer for that? And then you said voting, and I was like, yep, that's the answer. What mundane superpower would you have? Mm. The problem is that all the superpowers I want are, like, too intense. I would like to teleport, but that's not mundane. Yeah, I think that mun- yeah, teleportation is the best superpower. Yeah. Like, if somebody ever asks you what superpower do you want, like, that's the definitive answer. Mm -hmm. I feel like mundane superpower is something that would fundamentally not alter your life in a significant way. And for me, that would be the ability to fall asleep on planes. You know, that's just like a regular power people have. I don't think you can count that as a superpower. I don't think I've ever slept on a plane. And as we know from the podcast, I have traveled to Laos, which is about a 40 hour trip from the US. And um, it's no wonder why when I first when I first arrived, I had like a massive mental breakdown because I hadn't slept in like two days. Christ. And I was just suddenly alone in a, in a foreign country. God. But then it all worked out. So it's fine. But I wish I could sleep on planes because I think that would just make my quality of life better. I'll allow it, but that's not a superpower. That's just a regular thing people can do that you simply cannot. But that's why it's a mundane superpower. No, but I think a superpower has to be something that's like hard. Whatever, we can debate this later. I think mine is, okay. I would like to be able to turn like my fear off for periods of time because I think that would make my life a lot easier. I feel, li I feel like then you would just end up doing crazy shit, but like in a fun way. Yeah, it'd be fine. No, okay. I, I mean this for completely sincere reasons because I actually have a really bad fear of heights that is actually mm -hmm. really annoying in my daily life because it's stuff like going up a, an escalator that's like you know like you know when they're like in the middle of something and you can see down and like how every place likes to build it like that yeah when you went to see the minions yeah movie. exactly like that place like like halfway up there like I my brain was just like, I cannot fucking deal with these escalators anymore. I'm getting in the elevator. And it's also really bad for when I'm flying and I fly like a decent amount. So mm -hmm. this would actually affect my life in a way that was meaningful. I like how we both want to make flying an easier Yo, experience for ourselves. why has humanity made flying simply the most miserable experience on earth? I'm just putting <laughs> that out there. We took flight and we made it bad. Um, this is now a Seinfeld bit. <laughs> Yeah. Alexa wants to know, how do you think the internet has changed our art making? That's like actually, see, I love how we're going from like my flying rant to um, <laughs> this question, which is actually very deep. I mean, there's two answers to this, right? Like first, like mater materials wise, the internet existing and digital like technology existing is a thing that like everybody's dealing with has opened up like just huge avenues of like types of art that would not be made otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I mean this both in the sense that like, yeah, dude, people are making videos, people are making games, but also in the sense that like, like there's like one series of paintings that's just like anyone who's played a video game can see that it's like levels of video games that are being painted from outside of the frame that you usually see. So you see all like the broken bits. Mm -hmm. 
so like all of this shit doesn't exist unless the medium of the internet exists and on the other hand like the other thing here is that like the internet changes the way that we think about stuff i think to a degree that's like really meaningful because this is my hot take as someone who spends like seven hours online a day at minimum is that i don't think we were meant to have this level of like connectivity or information and i think it is creating yeah. some really fucked up shit in people's brains said tweet <laughs> i also i mean speaking of like paintings and stuff or i don't know if you said paintings or if my brain I just went paintings. there and i thought mm-hmm. you said it Okay, yeah. So there's an artist that I think is really cool named Trevor Shimizu, and he does the thing where he, like, paints digital things. Mm. So, like, I think he has a painting, and it's a painting of one of those apps that shows you who's unfollowed you, (laughs) and I just think it's very fun. Like, I love stuff like that. My pet peeve in the art world is people that think that because something is contemporary, that means it's not sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And I think, as you said, like, the internet is doing crazy things to our brains, both in good ways and bad ways. Like, I actually just read a book called Because Internet by Gretchen McCulloch, which I would highly recommend. And it's about the linguistics of the internet. And it's kind of, like, fascinating to talk about how, like, regional speech is is changing because it's easier for regional things to spread Mm -hmm. because of the internet. In the book, she talks about how linguists use Twitter to track, like, the spread of certain regional language, and I think that's fascinating. Yeah, that's cool as hell. You know, actually, I was gonna say, you know what's actually weird as shit is that, like, I have, like, a a quote-unquote internet accent in that, like, the way that I speak is super enhanced by growing up online, and, you know, that's not just me. That's, like, a lot of people my age, and that's something that just wouldn't exist before this definitely same like i do say internet isms in daily Mm -hmm. life like my friend dan um (laughs) is a a copy editor and was copy editing something about a new type of sidewalk in uh in the netherlands and then my reaction was new sidewalk just dropped (laughs) and then now we've just been saying new sidewalk just dropped like as a bit but that's like that sentence would not make any sense like 10 years ago honestly i love saying a new blank just dropped i think that's a really good meme also just how do you make a new sidewalk well sidewalk 2 the sequel to sidewalk see this is another thing that's from whatever like i think okay i guess the internet has changed art making just like fundamentally in the sense that like any new technological shift like creates new shit something something the <laughs> art in the age of mechanical reproduction <laughs> yes we did it we, did we it. solved this another like two deep question from Alexa. What are your favorite pieces of art or media that capture what it feels like to be on the internet? You're gonna groan at my answer, but I think that Hank Green, an absolutely remarkable thing, is a very accurate and interesting look into what it does to you as a person and your ego and your vulnerability when you go super viral. I'm gonna take out these headphones and walk over there and lie on the couch. Jesus fucking Christ, Amanda. (laughs) You're valid, but you're not valid. It's a good book. (laughs) Okay, my answer is like a little bit weird, but I think like the artwork that Young Hei Chang Heavy Industries makes kind of feels like the internet to me, even though it's like very basic shit. I feel like that's one of the things that I know the name of this person because I think that they did an exhibit when we were in college, like at Penn. They do that one thing where it's like all of the words, like it's a story and it's getting told to you in a way that's almost like reminiscent of bead reading technology. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason that it, it feels like the internet to me is just the speed of the information being given to you and it's complete lack of reference but sometimes it's meaningful i don't know the first time i saw their stuff was like actually my dad's college in korea and Mm. it was playing in the lobby on a zillion monitors and so that kind of felt like the future to me i don't know yeah i like how i forgot the name of this artist and then i look at them and i'm like oh yeah this was a big influence for me in my college art (laughs) when i literally the font that they use in this art is the font that i used in everything i think it's called like monica it's a good font it's a very good font for internet art and i'm like damn you know when you copy an artist and you don't even realize it even i mean i I didn't copy them i just used the same that's called being influenced by them (laughs) <laughs> yeah okay yes i do know who that artist is and yes good moving on if you could instantly learn a new skill what would you choose asks jock sleeping on a plane <laughs> <laughs> no i think the actual answer is like being fluent in another language i would probably choose spanish to be fluent in that's like useful. maybe japanese because i feel like just i would like to spend more time in japan but i think i've already filled my quota of like white person living in asia for my life (laughs) 
and I don't know, I guess Spanish is just the language that I know the best, although I feel, I don't know if I know Lao or Spanish better at this point, honestly. But I, I don't know, I just, I grew up in South Florida, even though I'm a white, non-Hispanic person, that's slightly less appropriative than me being like, I'm gonna go live in Japan. You could say that you want to learn Spanish or Japanese, it's fine. Okay. I'll give you like a POC card, I don't fucking know. I feel like learning <laughs> languages is fine, like, my opinion is that people should learn more languages. I say having like one and a half languages at best. I feel like you have two languages. My Korean's really bad. I don't know. I mean, I I don't know the difference, but I've heard you speak Korean and I'm like, damn, that's Korean. It, yeah, damn, that sure is Korean. No, I have the specific like second gen issue of I can understand most Korean, but when I speak it, it comes out with like both an American accent and also like I have a really shitty vocabulary because I mostly talk with my family. So it's like, yo, yeah. you know, things I can talk about. Food, where the bathroom is, ordering food, types of food, I'm hungry, that's it. I, I might have told this story on the pod, but uh, real quick, at one point in Laos, I gave blood and then I fainted because I just, I that just, that's happened. And I was trying to explain in Lao, like, what happened to me, because I just, like, opened my eyes and there were just these, like, Lao women looking at me, <laughs> like, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know the word for giving blood, so I was like, I gave the red liquid. <laughs> Did they understand you? I think they were just, I, I don't know. <laughs> I I just kind of was like, it's all good. I'm okay now. Like, I just was a little woozy. I did not wait the 15 minutes after getting blood drawn. And then I went directly into like 95 degree heat. And it was just a bad decision. Yeah, that sounds hard and reasonable to faint. I would also just probably pick a language and I'd be want to be better at Korean. But other than that, I'd, I'd want to like be good at art. But like, I'd like to be good at like, like graphic novel art, if that makes sense. Because that's a skill I just don't yeah. have that I think would be fun to have. I think these are things that you can do for yourself. Yeah, but I'm not gonna. Baskets wants to know, dream podcast guest. Craig, next question. Brian David Gilbert. Well, I was gonna say Brian David Gilbert, who wrote the great song, It's Time to Get Good at Darts, and also is just a great internet person. Google him if you don't know who he is. And yeah, Craig Newmark, uh, Craig from Yeah, Craigslist. I just feel like yeah. we have to complete that bit. The thing about having BDG on the pod is that I wouldn't know how to act with him because he's like our age and he's like w wildly more successful. And I'm like, so teach me your ways, internet funny man. I genuinely don't, like, I, I don't know how I would interact with him. I, you know, I think if I met him in real life, I would just be like regular at him. But if I was having him as a guest on the pod, I would not be regular at him. Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's a lot easier to meet people if you're just like, oh, hey, what's up? And you're just kind of like being a person. But then when you're interviewing someone in the context of like you are an esteemed guest on our show that's kind of a different kind of socialization i feel like the problem is that i would feel a lot of pressure to be funny if bdg was here and i think bdg would also be having pressure to feel funny but i feel like he always feels pressure to be funny so it wouldn't be that different for him you know it would also be really funny what <laughs> just like as a bit i just think it would be very funny what if we had like obama on the podcast yo obama on the podcast let's fucking go <laughs> And then we just asked him, like, why did you write about ethereal bisexuals <laughs> in your book? I think that would be really funny. I think that would be good. I think that would be a good podcast guest. Oh, um, on the dark yeah. side, I think it would be very funny to have Elon on as, like, an unwilling guest. Like, he doesn't want to be oh, here, God. but for some reason he has to be. And we're just grilling him about, like, so the babies, man. <laughs> Do you have more of them? Oh, and then this also, do we have predictions on how the Elon Twitter trial is going to go? Wire wants to know. Oh, my hot take is that I think it's just going to settle, but that's also because I'm biased because most things settle. And I don't know if anyone really wants Elon to buy Twitter. So I think they're just going to be like, okay, fine. We're just shuffle some money around. We're good. We're fine. Let's fucking go. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. I think at this point, it's just like Twitter just wants money. I, d I don't think Twitter wants to be owned by Elon because Elon doesn't want to own Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a fundamental issue, even though Twitter's shareholders did vote in favor of it like this week. But I think that's also because when shareholders vote, the vote is simply, is this in our financial best interest? Mm -hmm. And yes, Elon Musk giving them $44 billion is in their best interest. But I think what's actually best for the company is if Elon Musk gives them like 20 billion dollars and then fucks off right so we'll see how it plays out but i'm just kind of betting on him not actually buying twitter it's settling for some amount of money whatever happens happens yeah on that note yeah what do you think about horses just like in general good i don't like the way that they walk around on their fingers 
<laughs> I think their poop smells bad, but like they're fine. Anyway, Morkai wants to know favorite Tumblr drama. God, I think the one, this isn't drama, but I like that the Cybersmith is still here after so, so long. And the fact that he insists that it's fine to have a human pet. And everyone's like, oh, hey, it's the human pet guy when he shows up. Oh, God. I think someone told me about that on the island, I think. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, no, he's been here for like a decade. He swapped to Twitter for a while, and then he came back to Tumblr because Twitter like bullied him off. But, you know, he, he's just human pet guy, and that's just an absurd sort of man to have on your social media site that everyone can recognize the name of. <sighs> My understanding of this briefly was that this guy just decided that it would be fun if he had a human pet. No, he, he describes the situation in which he has a human pet. Like he writes out like a whole paragraph long thing. We're not going to read it here. It's like gross. Where he just has a human pet and it's just part of his life. And then there's a lot of back and forth back in the day about like, yo, what the fuck, man? And him ins insisting that it's fine, which has sort of cooled down into the fact that he will occasionally comment on posts that have nothing to do with the human pet thing, just because, you know, he's on social media. And then inevitably someone will be like, oh, hey, it's the human pet guy. And I think he's frustrated by the fact that that's the only thing people recognize him for. Yeah, but also that post was like one of the worst things that was ever posted on the It was internet. so bad. It was so bad. On a happier note, how do you feel about astrology and how much of our chart do we know without looking it up? I'm an Aquarius and that's all I've got. I think that astrology is fun, but I don't think it actually means much. But also I know a significant amount about my chart. I am a Taurus sun, Taurus rising, and Aquarius moon. So we share that. Oh, shit. Speaking of how much of my chart do I know without looking it up, I just have a fuck ton of Taurus in my chart. Like, please psychoanalyze me. <laughs> I also know that my Venus is in Gemini, which apparently means that I am two-faced in romance, which I don't know if that's true. You, you sounded very pensive there. The things I have it written down somewhere, but the only part of it I've memorized is, yeah, I'm an Aquarius. And apparently that means I'm like a little bit of a freak. Yeah, I think that means you're like creative, which is true. Mm -hmm. We need Mystic Michaela on. We need Mystic Michaela on. <laughs> Mystic Michaela. Okay, the other thing about Mystic Michaela is that she sounds like an Ace Attorney character. I, I probably said that before. I just wanted to say it again. So let's go into like the writing zone because now we can do ads. Psych, this was all an ad drop, but favorite piece of writing consumed in the last year. And Allison followed that up with fiction and nonfiction. So split this up. Well, first off, you can go to Libro FM and use code WOW at checkout to get two books for the price of one. They are audiobooks and Libro FM is simply what if audible, but not Amazon. On. Shout out to my husband, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Favorite fiction, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Favorite nonfiction, um, I might go with Because Internet by Gretchen McCulloch, which I already mentioned on this episode. Yeah, and if you want like real books... Oh, I said that like a, like a real pretentious asshole. If you want a book that you can read with your <laughs> eyes instead of your ears, bookshop.org slash... I forgot the rest of it, fuck. Bookshop.org slash shop slash wow if true. And that's just some books that we like. And if you buy them from our shop, then we get a little bit of money. Yeah, and honestly, we should update that with more of the books that we've read. But like, honestly, our favorites are there and it's a good time. We should all own more books. Damn. I buy too Brandon many Sanderson is on there. I, I fucking love Brandon Sanderson, okay? I haven't looked at our bookshop.org in, in a while. And you can make like different lists of books. And unbeknownst to me, you made a list called Half the Podcast is Asian American. And then it's just books about being Asian. I thought I told you I, about I, that. I, you probably told me, but I forgot. But I think it's funny. And also I've read like some of the books here and thought that they were good. Nice. So. Yeah. I got my Asian American Heritage Month bookshop.org like little shelf there. I actually need to update it because one of my favorite pieces I read this year was How to Write an Autobiographical Novel by Alexander Chi. And that's a nonfiction book about, it's about being gay, but it's also about like him trying to write his novel. And I really resonated with that as someone who was trying to write their novel. Nice. And then hmm, favorite fiction that I read, we're interpreting this as new fiction, right? Like as opposed to things that we've read 5 million times. Times, because if it's five million times, then my answer is Murderbot, because all I do is reread Murderbot. But if we're talking about like new books, I think probably the Red Rising series. Actually, I don't know if it's actually called the Red Rising series, but I know the first book is called Red Rising. And that was actually a recommendation from my agent. And he was like, I think you'd like this. And I was like, fuck, I do like this. God damn. Shout out to Steven. Speaking of art, next question is, if you could eat one piece of art, what would it be and why? Okay, so I had an 
comedian answers this and that I would eat the scream because I fucking hate the scream and I don't want it to exist anymore. I just think it sucks. Damn. Don't ask me any more questions. I just don't like it. <laughs> You're looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> no, I think it's fine. Um, also, part of the question was suffer no ill effects, not go to jail, etc. I would do this even if I would go to jail. Anyway. <laughs> it would be fun to eat like neon art, like... Tracy Emin or like Dan Flavin or something just because it's like I think it'd be fun to eat neon with no ill effects. I love this. I love that you're, you're going for like what would be experientially the best piece of art that I could eat and I'm just kind of like I hate the son of a bitch. I need it off the face of the earth. I will destroy it with my mouth. <laughs> There's also this one artist whose name I forget. I'm so sorry. She's an Asian American artist and makes like sculptures of Asian American food products. And I think it would be fun to eat those because I like the food. Like, would you eat a gold plated dumpling? I mean, you can get that at a restaurant. They got gold leaf, man. Damn. Oh, okay. The artist's name is Stephanie H. Sh. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I'm so sorry. It's S H I H. Okay. Rapid fire. Terminal online this test. Are you familiar with Mothman? Yes or no? Like, yes. Rat Kings? No. Number Stations? No. Ian Nasser? No. The Cask of Amontillado? <laughs> I'm familiar with it in that I've read it, like, in high school English, but I don't know why that's apparently terminally online. The Chernobyl Elephant Foot? No. Also, okay, I don't like this because I think this is like, are you terminally online on Tumblr? And I'm not. No, so. this is fascinating because yeah, I'm, I am, I am aware of all of these things, which is why I asked you because my answer to all of these things is yes, except for the number stations because I don't know what the meme around number stations is. I could explain these, but we're running out of time. So you're just going to have to live with this knowledge or not live with it, I guess. Damn. So, okay. The next question's a fun one. Remember the Bad Art Friend episode in which there was this like massive New York Times article about drama about a writer who donated a kidney and then other writers like made fun of her for donating a kidney but she was also kind of weird about it our friend emmy who was on the pod our resident doctor of wow if true check out our ask a doctor anything episode emmy's donating a kidney and she wants to know what we think about that you know like honestly like i think this is an interesting question because it's very much a like hey you guys discourse this weird situation now i am doing this weird situation how do you feel about it because emmy's also donating the kidney not to anyone that she knows just kind of like yeah i'm gonna donate a kidney and help the world so i think donating a kidney is objectively a good thing like that is a very selfless kind thing that emmy is doing to help somebody but the difference between her and the bad art friend or or not the bad art friend who we don't know who the bad art friend is that's like the 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 thing is it's open to interpretation but the difference between her and that character is that emmy is just like yeah i'm donating a kidney she's not like everybody worship me because i'm donating a kidney emmy, i think you should start acting like everyone should worship me because i'm donating a kidney because then we could have beef against you and then we could all get written up in the new york times and i think that would be really good for all of our brands that's my thoughts on this signify nothings wants to know what was your first slash core memory youtube video oh this sucks but it's charlie the unicorn i was honestly gonna say the same thing yo this says so much about us and also what era of the internet we're from yeah what vine slash tiktok video do you quote irl oh god nobody gets this but music is that music love music is it coming <laughs> from the green or the black from vine i love they were roommates <laughs> and then also wow <laughs> And from TikTok right now, I'm into, it's corn. Yo, corn kid is living my dream. Anyway, is a Pop-Tart a ravioli? I think who cares, but just for the purpose of being divisive on the internet, yes. I was also going to say yes. Great, we're going to get canceled now. All right, Bray has given us just the worst graph and a bunch of questions, and it sucks so bad. I'm honestly impressed. All right, this graph. It is a XY axis graph, and on the Y axis at the top, there's male manipulator, and at the bottom, there's twink with an attitude problem. On the other axis, there is 12-year-old boy and Splatoon character. And Bray has asked us where we would place first, ourselves. I think I'm kind of in the middle. <laughs> Equidistant from male manipulator, twink with an attitude problem, <laughs> Splatoon character, and 12-year-old boy. Yes, that's my final answer. I can't tell if this is objectively the best or worst outcome for you. I don't know. I feel like I feel like I have a little bit of all these things in me. I kind of think that I'm somewhere between male manipulator and Splatoon character. Okay. Yeah. You know, because of because of how I was like, oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna just 
kill the guy that you marry in the first question that we had in this episode. Amazing. Next is Elon Musk, which I think he's in the top left corner. That means he is extremely male manipulator 12 year old boy. See, I'm gonna go ahead and say that he's he wants to be male manipulator, but he's actually 12 year old boy and twink with an attitude problem. I will accept no criticism on this. Okay, Destiel is one entity, so Dean and Cass. So I don't actually know their personalities, I just know the lore. So I'm gonna say like in the middle of the quadrant that is twink with an attitude problem and splatoon character. See, I would just put them precisely on twink with an attitude problem, like all the way at the end. Nice. Okay. Eric wants to know if the hosts had to write fanfic about each other, what would the plot be and what would be the genre slash IP? That's such an interesting question. Okay, so for you, I have the plot, but not the IP. Okay. Actually, let's say the IP is supernatural. Just Oh, that sucks so bad. Go on. I'm immediately enchanted. So I think the plot is that it's just you and your daily life and you're like doing lawyer things, but it has a slipstream element where your law firm secretly has like a secret department that you get transferred to and it's like the supernatural department (laughs) and then you end up in like I don't know the plot of Supernatural but they do something with like ghosts yeah I have to to fucking like audit the ghosts or something I don't know (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, that's the fanfic. That's it. And then you become friends with Destiel, and then you just kind of, like, go to a carnival with them and just hang out with them, and you're just kind of there. And then maybe they set you up with a nice ghost. (laughs) I love that this ends up with me dating a ghost. (laughs) 10 out of 10. I would read this fanfic. Okay. (laughs) Me too. So I'm torn on what IP to give you, but because I've been reading Captain America fic, and there's, like, a lot of this- Oh, God. there's, There's a lot of this genre. Of, of this genre fic in the Captain America fandom specifically, and I think you would do an interesting job, is that, like, there's a whole genre of, like, reporter has to deal with, like, superheroes. And I think that would be really fun to put you in as the main character where you have to deal with Captain America who doesn't know anything about technology. And it's like, you are trying to write a piece about, like, all of this shit exists and this man is from the 1940s. And I would just like to read that piece. I like that. I like that. Also, speaking of the reporter trying to figure out how to report on superheroes plot and speaking of Eric the question asker and speaking of podcasts you don't listen to, that does happen in Join the Party. I do listen to join the party but again I am so fucking behind again. Well Tegan delightful character and on my first listen through I was like fuck Tegan they're gonna fuck shit up and then Lada was like how dare you. Damn yeah I don't have a good way to end this end this episode. You know honestly I'm just glad we got to 51 episodes. Me too I'm proud of us like we're doing great. I think we're doing a great job and all these questions are great thank you for sending them in sorry if we didn't get to your question this is already so long and we are dying and by that I mean I want to go take a shower. That's more about me than you need to know. Hell yeah. And on that note, if you like this episode, tell a friend. Word of mouth is how we grow. Thank you to all of our patrons and shout out specifically to Zoe, Bray, Andre, Thea, Brian, and Gabriel. If you want your name in the above or in our Twitter header, slide right into our Patreon at patreon.com slash wowtrue. Shout out to Allison Mills, beloved audio editor, and to graphic designer and Canva warlock Eric Silver, who made our logo, and Sam Reiser, who made our podcast music. You can find us on Twitter as at wowtruepod and Instagram and Facebook as at wowtrue. Had your 15 seconds of internet fame? Slide right into our Twitter DMs and tell us about it. Until next time, let's get famous on the internet. What happened there was Isabel stopped recording and then I was like, wait, we were missing a line. So I just said it.